Welcome back, and thank you all for joining us for our follow-on discussion regarding whether the lottery issue is an issue for some traditional Christian views. Our guest last week not only explained her problems justifying to God believing a traditional Christian view, but also started offering an alternative explanation. An explanation I have invited her to continue this week. Welcome. Thanks for having me back. It's our pleasure. Now last week you outlined some issues in the New Testament, which led to you having trouble justifying to God believing in certain parts of it. And you gave us an alternative account, which as you said was pure speculation. It involved Jesus being executed for apparently breaking the Sabbath law, surviving the execution, and performing the sign of Jonah that he had promised by being in the tomb for three days and three nights. And you used artwork from the early followers to support your speculation. You also mentioned that in your alternative account, the 4th century Roman Emperor Constantine makes up the New Testament. What I'm hoping you'll explain this week is not only what motive you think Constantine would have had for doing such a thing, but also how you think he could possibly have gotten away with it. Well, I'll try. Remember in this alternative account, I'm imagining that the early followers took the parable of the lost sheep and being fishermen of the living to mean that they should go out and preach. And that gave them a presence in cities, even when their numbers were quite small. And the approach meant they were actively converting by means of their account of Jesus. Some of the work by the Roman historian Cassius Dio still survives. And he mentions that in the reign of Tiberius, Jewish people flocked to Rome in great numbers and were converting many of the natives to their ways. He dates this to around 19 CE, but in this alternative account, it was in the reign of Tiberius, but nearer the end of it, around 35 CE. Given that Dio wasn't born until about 120 years after that, being a few years out doesn't surprise me. Now while in this alternative account I do consider some of the summaries of later books to be forgeries, I assume the first 60 books aren't. Because Jewish people aren't known for trying to convert people to Judaism. And because, in the alternative account, the early followers of Jesus would be expected to be Jewish, and to be fishers of men, trying to save the lost sheep. And that they are referred to as Jewish, seems to me to make it unlikely that it was a construction done after Constantine came to power. Because if it was, then I would have expected them to have been called Christians, and for the date to be later. Why in the alternative account wouldn't they have been called Christians? Because in the alternative account, the followers were thinking that Jesus was the prophet Elijah, who had been prophesied to come by Malachi, in Malachi 4 verse 5. And the next verse, verse 6, had indicated that he would turn the hearts of the fathers back to their children and the hearts of the children to the fathers or else God would strike the land with complete destruction. And just as a side issue, in the alternative account, the idea of turning the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers in Malachi 4-6 is why, in the artwork in the Roman catacombs, there were often depictions of a father and child. And since Jesus had been crucified, it wouldn't be too strange if those that believed he was the prophesied prophet Elijah decided to leave the land that they thought would be struck with destruction. Plus, it would be understandable if there was some social tension with them and the priests, since they were suggesting that the priests and the non-believers had been behind the crucifixion of a prophet and weren't repentant about it. Ah, uh, I hadn't realized. So at this point in your account, the followers aren't viewed as Christians. No, the early ones were simply Jewish people that believed Jesus was the prophet Elijah. And even though later followers weren't Jewish, they are still being imagined to follow at least some of the Jewish law and no longer worship the state gods. I see. So carry on. You were saying how they were coming to Rome preaching. Yes. Though they weren't just preaching that the prophesied prophet Elijah had appeared and preaching the message that Jesus had preached. They were also explaining how the prophet had offered a sign, the sign of Jonah, and that he performed it when those around him doubted and thought it would be impossible for him to do so. But given that the Roman general Pompey had historically entered the temple and nothing had happened, and later in the First Judeo-Roman War, the temple had been destroyed by the Romans, wouldn't the followers have a problem convincing others of God's existence? I'm not sure how devastating Pompey entering the temple would have been, because I assume the temples of the state gods had been desecrated before. Plus, Pompey was later killed, reportedly stabbed by a sword and then daggers, before having his head chopped off. As for how the believers viewed the destruction of the temple, 
as I said the followers were expecting destruction in Judea because of the crucifixion of Jesus. The destruction of the temple just seemed to them to be a fulfillment of the Malachi 4 verse 6 prophecy or Malachi 3 verse 24 as it is in the Jewish publication society Tanakh. Early on the followers would have preached about the prophesied destruction and then later with the destruction of the temple it would have appeared as though destruction they had preached about had come true and that would likely have helped improve their conversion rate though that isn't to suggest that the followers were unified in their interpretation of the Malachi prophecy. Because, for example, Malachi 3 verse 1 had also prophesied that the Lord they were seeking would come suddenly to his temple. And amongst the believers, the interpretation was split. Some thinking that while the messenger was Elijah, the Lord who was going to come to his temple was going to be the Messiah. While others were thinking that Elijah was both the messenger and the Lord that they were seeking. Once the temple was destroyed, some could have believed that the Messiah would appear and rebuild the temple while others could have have thought that Elijah was both the messenger and the Messiah, and had come to the temple in his Jesus incarnation, and would come back again to bring world peace in a later one. So even though some thought that Jesus was Christ, you wouldn't have expected them to be called Christians? That's right, because even within a community, there could have been a difference of opinion on that matter. Whereas the other points we discussed would be fundamental to their beliefs, the amount that thought Elijah was the Messiah could vary over time being believed by only a minority before the destruction of the temple, before becoming quite a popular explanation of events after its destruction, before then becoming less popular again at the beginning of the second century when it looked like Emperor Hadrian might let the temple be rebuilt. The destruction of Judea in around 135 CE made the prospect of the temple being rebuilt seem negligible, and that in turn led more to believe that Elijah had come to the temple as Jesus and would come back yet again as the Messiah. Anyway, in this alternative account, the desolation of Judea following the Third Jewish-Roman War was taken as a clear sign by the followers that Jesus was Elijah, and that rejecting his teachings had brought utter destruction upon the land, as had been prophesied by Malachi. They could explain the delay between the rejection of Jesus by the priests and the destruction brought upon Judea through Jesus' response when asked upon for a sign. A part of the response was that there would only be one sign for that generation, not that there would only be one sign. And little over 100 years after the rejection of Jesus by the priests, when that generation would have been dead, the destruction of Judea was a second sign that Jesus had been the prophet Elijah. The earlier destruction of the temple being reinterpreted as a warning, giving the Jewish people that weren't followers of Jesus a chance to understand that Jesus was the prophet Elijah despite what they had thought. A warning which gave them an opportunity to repent and change their ways. With each follower actively trying to spread the message, awareness of what had happened grew quickly, and the amount of followers began to rapidly increase. Okay, but all this is way before Constantine was born, and in this conversation you are going to explain why Constantine would have been interested in the movement. Because with each follower going out and trying to bring people to the path, their numbers had grown exponentially. And by the time of Constantine, a few hundred years later, they were numerous, not just amongst the civilian population, but also within the army. So much so that they started to cause problems within Roman society, because the followers weren't just catering for a niche need in the religious marketplace. They were talking of the one God and encouraging the converts to no longer worship any other gods or spirits, including the genii of the Roman army. The problems had reached such a point that the state had tried to crack down on them and control the problem. That by the time of Constantine, a majority were aware of Jesus and of the prophesied signs that supposedly indicated he had indeed been the prophesied prophet Elijah. Perhaps it would be useful for your listeners if I explained what I've been given to believe the Roman state was like at the time of Constantine, and what I've been given to believe about the background about the man himself. Be my guest. As I understand it, the empire was being ravaged by internal conflict and pressure of invasion from the outside. And on top of that, there had been plague outbreaks. This 50-year period has become known as the crisis of the 3rd century. Starting in 235 CE, Severus Alexander was murdered by his own troops. The year 238 saw six men claiming to be emperor. Around 250 persecution of the followers of Jesus started when Decius apparently ordered all citizens to perform a sacrifice in the presence of commissioners. 
many followers refused. And while the persecution carried on for about a year, the order was revoked a shortly before Decius's death in 251. The reason I mention it is because in the alternative account, the order to sacrifice in the presence of commissioners was because of how big a problem it had become for the state. The less educated non-followers fearing that the calamities befalling the empire were because of the gods being angry over the refusal of the followers to pay homage to them. It also worried some of the soldiers who feared the genii that were supposed to protect them in battle might also be angered by some of the army soldiers refusing to worship them. By 268, the empire had split into three competing states. It was temporarily united by Emperor Aurelian, before becoming divided again within a couple of years of his murder. By 282, Emperor Carus took over, and lasted about a year. And on his death, his two sons took over, one governing the east, one governing the west. The son in the east also lasted about a year, and on his death, the brother in the west declared himself emperor of the east also. But a man who became known as Diocletian also claimed the east. Both claimants came into conflict, and Diocletian won. Anyway, you can get the idea. Emperors weren't lasting long, and there was a lot of internal conflict which foreign powers tried to take advantage of. In those fifty years from the death of Severus to when Diocletian took over, there had been over twenty men that had been emperor or co-emperor of the empire. It was from about the time of Diocletian that I wanted to talk about things, though, as it was while he was a co-emperor that Constantine's father was made a Caesar. Once he had beaten the brother in the West, Diocletian was the emperor of the whole empire, and in 285 he made a man named Maximian Caesar under him. The following year, he split the kingdom into two and promoted Maximian to co-emperor, Diocletian being Augustus of the Eastern Empire and Maximian being Augustus of the Western Empire. And then in 293, both took on Caesars of their own, Galerius under Diocletian and Constantine's father Constantius under Maximian. The idea seems to have been that the Caesar should not be a direct descendant of the Augustus to prevent the ruling of either the eastern or western part becoming a family affair, allowing men of ambition a peaceful means to becoming an Augustus, being chosen to be a Caesar under an existing Augustus. Constantine's father had married Maximian's daughter, and he lived with her and their children in the Western Empire. Constantine, however, had been born to a different woman, and he was sent to serve under the Caesar Galerius in the Eastern Empire, a Caesar who Constantine reportedly claimed put his life in danger in numerous occasions. Anyway, in 305 CE, both Diocletian and Maximian retired. Constantius and Galerius were each promoted to Augustus, Constantius being made Augustus of the Western Empire, and Galerius being made Augustus of the Eastern Empire, and each appointed a new Caesar. It is reported that Constantine thought he was going to become Caesar under his father when his father was promoted to Augustus, but he wasn't. Instead, a man named Severus was. It was then Constantine reportedly did something remarkable. He reportedly fled the Eastern Empire, going from postal station to postal station, taking a fresh horse and damaging those left behind to hinder any that might have tried to pursue him. I've read that Julius Caesar used pigeons to carry messages in his conquest of Gaul but it doesn't seem that they were able to cut him off by messaging ahead. Anyway, Constantine arrives in Britain where his father was, and within a week his father is dead. And Constantine claims his father's title of Augustus. Are you suggesting Constantine murdered his father? In this alternative account, yes. The two contemporary accounts of what happened were given by two characters, which I am imagining Constantine used as propaganda writers. Lactantius and Eusebius. Lactantius, in the manner in which persecutors died, claimed that Constantine's father was ill and wrote a letter requesting Constantine's presence, and that the Eastern Augustus gave him the papers to allow him to travel, but planned to stop him somehow. But Constantine had expected as much and left earlier to avoid being stopped, taking horses from the publicly maintained horse posts. The account has Constantine getting away and arriving at his father's side as he was about to expire. Nevertheless, his father is reported as recommending Constantine to the soldiers and handing him sovereign power before dying. Eusebius didn't comment while Constantine was alive. But when Constantine died in Book 1, Chapter 20 of his book, Life of Constantine, 
Eusebius claims that the emperors in power were looking to inflict some brand of disgrace on Constantine. But Constantine, being aware of their designs for him, fled. In chapter 21, Eusebius goes on to state that Constantine arrived at his father as he was surrounded by Constantine's stepbrothers and sisters, and that his father jumped up at his unexpected presence and embraced him. Then taking final leave of the circle of sons and daughters that surrounded him, Constantine's father bequeathed his empire to Constantine. As I understand it, that was written while Eusebius was working for Constantine's third oldest son, and that while some of Constantine's step-siblings had died before him, other ones were murdered within a year of the death of Constantine. So while the account has Constantine's step-siblings as witnesses to Constantine's father's illness prior to Constantine arriving, I'm not sure any were left alive to confirm or deny the account's claims. I have read that Constantine's sons spared only one cousin, Julian, presumably on account of him being so young that they thought they could control him. Apart from accounts of Lactantius and Eusebius, there is another source about what happened, a collection of speeches known as the Panegyrici Latini. In this alternative account, I'm imagining that the majority of the speeches in the collection were fabricated after the death of Constantine by the propaganda team of the Emperor Theodosius who reigned over 60 years after the death of Constantine. The sixth speech of that collection is supposedly a speech made to Constantine. In it, Constantine is depicted as turning up after the fleet had set sail to Britain. It has the idea of him reaching his father's side as his father was about to die, and his father looking at Constantine as he died. In that account, the army selects Constantine to take over from his father. So what's your alternative account suggesting? that Constantine arrives with the claim that his father was being betrayed, that the Eastern Augustus had allied with the new Western Caesar with the intention of taking over as emperor of the whole empire, that Constantine used his military experience to embellish the account with a plausible military strategy for them, and also concocted a story as to how he came to know of their plans, that his story was convincing enough to allow him the opportunity to poison his father and blame the death on the shock of hearing of the betrayal by the Eastern Emperor. That he was by his father's side as his father died, and that his father was looking at him as he died. That Constantine told the officers that his father regretted his mistake and wanted him to take over, and the army backed him after he told them he had a plan. The plan being? That now, thanks to the warning by Constantine, Galerius had lost the opportunity for a surprise attack. That because Constantine's father's men were battle-hardened, having fought down uprisings, and the northern tribes, that the army should declare Constantine Augustus of the Western Roman Empire. As this would force Galerius to react, but now, without surprise on his side, he would likely negotiate, hoping for another opportunity at a later time. Constantine's underlying message would be that the splitting of the empire into two just didn't work as the Eastern Augustus's plan to betray his father had shown. And what the empire needed was a strong leader, supported by strong generals like themselves. He could hint that if they didn't support him, then they would eventually come under Galerius's control. And Galerius would never trust them, since he would suspect they knew of his betrayal of Constantine's father. To solve the problem, Galerius would simply send them on ridiculous campaigns of conflict, in the hope that either they would fail or succeed and give him great glory, while being so decimated that they would no longer be any threat if ever they did decide to rise up against him. That after evaluating the risk, the officers chose to appear righteous, while recognizing how they could profit if, they could, at a later date, make Constantine the leader of the whole Roman Empire. While at the same time avoiding the risks described by Constantine of coming under the control of Galerius a man Constantine knew better than any of them. So the army did as Constantine suggested and declared him the Western Augustus. This didn't sit well with Galerius, but as Constantine had predicted, he negotiated, offering an alternative. The alternative being that Severus should be the Western Augustus, as he had been the Caesar, and Constantine should instead take over as Caesar in his place. And as such, Constantine should control the same provinces as his father did when he was Caesar though Galerius did add what should appear as a sweetener. Galerius would hand over one of his own provinces to Severus, which made the western half of the empire bigger. And if Constantine was to one day be Augustus of that western empire, it meant that his part would be bigger. Apart from hoping to convince Constantine to accept the offer, 
Galerius hoped that the extra province would help empower Severus enough to contain Constantine. Constantine accepted, and Severus II became Augustus, and Constantine his Caesar. As I mentioned in this alternative account, the idea of splitting the empire with each half having an Augustus and Caesar wasn't supposed to be a family affair. But when Constantine became Caesar, a title which had seemed to come with a promise of being made the Western Augustus, if the Augustus should either die or retire, the idea of succession not being a family affair had been broken. For it seemed obvious Constantine's position was due to his father having been the Western Augustus. If it had been allowed to be a family affair, then Maximian, the Western Augustus Constantine's father was Caesar under, would never have made Constantine's father Caesar. Instead, he would have given the title to his own son, Maxentius. And unlike Constantine's father, Maxentius was very much still alive, and he led a rebellion in Rome, taking the title of prince rather than Augustus. And one of the first things he did was stop the persecution of the followers of Jesus. And support for him grew. This time, though, Galerius was in no mood to negotiate, and instead sent Severus against him. Maxentius in the meantime had convinced his father to come out of retirement, to once again be Augustus. From what I've seen on some websites, Italy from south of the River Po, Corsica, Sardinia, and Sicily, as well as the province of Africa, gave their support to Maximian. And by the time Severus arrived, Maxentius had secured the support of the Senate, the army, and the followers of Jesus in Rome. And something surprising happened. Severus's army began to fall apart with men deserting to join Maxentius in Rome. These desertions led to Severus being captured. Maximian and Maxentius had yet another threat to deal with, though. The son of Maximian's former Caesar, Constantine. Not wanting attacks from both Galerius and Constantine, Maximian reached out to Constantine and met him at Trier. He suggested to Constantine that the Tetrarchy shouldn't consist of two Augusti and Caesars. Instead, there should be four Augusti. If Constantine agreed, then they could cement the bond between them by Constantine marrying one of Maximian's daughters as his father had done. Furthermore, Maximian would have Severus executed. The death of Severus would strengthen Constantine's claim to legitimacy as Augustus of the West, as he was after all the Caesar when Severus was alive. And the recognition of Maximian by Constantine would in return strengthen Maximian's position, as he would be being recognized by the man who would have been Augustus of the West on the death of Severus. Constantine sensing a potential weakness in Galerius, and being wary of marching an army against Maximian, lest what happened to Severus happen to him agreed, and he married Fausta, Maximian's daughter, and Maxentius's sister. Galerius, though, had no intention of accepting Maximian. He, like Constantine, had assumed that Severus's army had deserted when up against Maximian because many in it previously served under him. But unlike many in Severus's and Constantine's army, the men in Galerius's army hadn't served under Maximian and Galerius had Diocletian on his side, and Galerius marched an army to Rome to crush the rebellion. Arriving at Rome, he set siege to it and gave Maxentius the opportunity to surrender. But Maxentius refused, and the strange thing happened again. Galerius's soldiers started deserting, and he wasn't able to maintain the siege. Instead, he had to return home with the remnants. So what's your explanation for the desertions? Well, in this alternative account, it is because the teachings of Jesus had permeated through society. Even some Epicureans had become believers. Would you mind just explaining who the Epicureans are? I'm sorry. Epicurus was a Greek philosopher who suggested that if gods did exist, they didn't care about what humans got up to. And in the alternative account, I am assuming most educated Romans agreed with Epicurus on that point, with only a few converting to become followers of Jesus. There is a villa that has been unearthed in Italy, which had been covered by ash and pumice from when Mount Vesuvius erupted in 79 CE. It contains the largest collection of Roman and Greek sculptures ever found in a single context, but is nevertheless known as the Villa of the Papyri, due to it being the only complete library of antiquity ever discovered. From what I have read, the works include large parts of several books from the work on nature, which is considered to be one of the main works of Epicurus. It also contains works of other early followers of Epicurus. Over 40 roles have been identified as the work of the later Epicurean philosopher and poet Philodemus. I apologize for not making it clear, but I am assuming that Constantine and many of his peers were Epicureans. 
at least to the extent that they thought that if gods did exist, they didn't care what humans got up to. Thank you for clearing that up. Please continue. I was explaining why I thought the soldiers deserted the armies brought against Maxentius and his father Maximian. Unlike Constantine and Galerius had thought, it hadn't been to do with many of the soldiers under Severus having once been under Maximian. It was that many were followers of Jesus, and one of the first things Maxentius had done was stop the persecution of them. And that is why the army of Galerius also started to desert. Because his army came from the east of the empire where the followers of Jesus had originated. And the followers unsurprisingly would rather serve in an army where they weren't persecuted or made to worship anything other than God. Thus, the rise of the followers was already starting to shape the history of the empire. With Constantine clearly aligned with Maximian, Galerius declared a new Augustus for the West, Licinius. The idea being that the amount of the empire loyal to him should be larger than the amount of the empire against him. And Licinius was keeping part of the Western Empire allied to him. Constantine declared himself an Augustus, as had both Maxentius and his father Maximian. And with Constantine's claim to the rank of Augustus came him taking control of the territory that his father had controlled as Augustus, which included the province of Hispania. The two failed attempts to take Rome led Constantine to realize the extent to which the followers of Jesus were found within the ranks of the common soldiery within the armies of the Eastern Empire and of Rome. Constantine realized that Maxentius had been a step ahead of him in realizing it, but once he realized it, Constantine went a step further. He had rumors spread that his mother was a follower of Jesus, and he had been converted and was secretly a follower also. Constantine was positioning himself to turn the factors that had given Maxentius an advantage against him. Meanwhile, Maxentius and his father were turning their attention to Constantine as an adversary and making plans of their own. Their plan involved staging an event in Rome where Maximian would publicly denounce Maxentius and try to take over, but would fail and be cast out. Maximian would then seek refuge with Constantine, and Constantine's spies would corroborate the story. Maximian would cast aside his imperial robes and claim to have no more leadership ambitions, instead wanting only what was best for Rome. The hope was that Constantine would trust Maximian as his father had. That while posing as a benevolent statesman, Maximian could act both as a spy and an opportunist, hoping at some point to get the opportunity to regain the loyalty of key figures in Constantine's army that had once been officers under him. They put their plan into action, Maximian coming to Constantine for shelter after seemingly falling out with Maxentius. And Constantine pretended not to suspect them. But Constantine imagined their ambitions and assumed he couldn't trust them. Instead, he used the opportunity to entrap his new father-in-law by talking to Fausta, his wife, and Maximian's daughter about an ambitious new plan he had, and opening up to his father-in-law Maximian about it also. In this alternative account, I'm guessing that it was a plan of a massive invasion across the Rhine, that he was going to conquer from a bridge at Cologne and link up to other territories of the Western Empire, and doing that using less than half his army, recruiting from the conquered tribes as he went, as Alexander of Macedon had done, how his name would go down in history alongside Alexander and Julius Caesar, how it would also open up the possibility of giving an unexpected march on Licinius to regain the remainder of the Western Empire. It was a plan ambitious enough to lead his father-in-law to not only believe it, but to see it as an opportunity to put his own plan into action while Constantine was out of the way on a plan of conquest fraught with danger in pursuit of fame and glory. If you don't mind me saying, you do seem to be speculating quite a lot here. Yes, it's just guesswork, and I'm not imagining that it's all going to be correct. I'm not claiming that any of it is. For example, maybe Constantine didn't offer that as a plan. Maybe he put forward another plan. But as I said, I'm not imagining all the details are going to be correct. The issue is about me justifying a belief in Orthodox Christianity to God. And I've already mentioned certain parts that concerned me. The issue then was, okay, I have concerns. But can I say to God that I could imagine an alternative that for all I knew was true? And the answer is that I can, and I am just giving an example of such an alternative. An alternative that would not just explain the concerns I mentioned, but also much of the artwork that I have seen from the catacombs in Rome. If it was a case of me having some problems with the Orthodox account, but not being able to imagine an alternative, then it would have been easier to justifying to God believing it. Okay, but just for the benefit of the listeners, 
You are being very speculative here. Yes, very speculative. And the basic speculation is that Constantine substantially made up the four Gospels and tried to considerably change the beliefs of the early followers. What I am offering at the moment is more like an example of how such a course of events could have come about. And the reason I'm mentioning the bits of history that I am mentioning is to answer your question of why Constantine would have concerned himself with the followers. The answer I'm offering is that they were becoming key in achieving military victories within the empire. Okay, so carry on. Constantine made out that he was putting his ambition into action and marched an army across the Rhine. And once messengers return informing Maximian that Constantine had crossed the Rhine, Maximian wasted no time in writing to the remaining commanders and trying to take over the army left behind. Once those letters had been received by the commanders, messengers were sent to Constantine, and he returned back across the Rhine. Once Maximian realized that he had been duped, he fled to Marseille, hoping then to be able to flee by sea back to his son in Rome. But as soon as he arrived in Marseille, he was arrested, and when Constantine arrived, he was handed over and killed by Constantine. Lactantius later wrote Constantine's propaganda about what happened. Lactantius claimed that the Franks had taken up arms, and Constantine's father-in-law advised Constantine to take a small force and leave the majority of the army behind, and that Constantine, not suspecting his father-in-law, did just that. And when the father-in-law thought that Constantine was in enemy territory, where he might be overpowered because he hadn't taken enough men, he resumed the imperial robes, seized the public treasures, and gave money to the soldiers. But Constantine returned, astonishingly quickly, and caught his father-in-law by surprise. That the father-in-law fled to Marseille, but when Constantine's army arrived, the city gates were thrown open, and Constantine entered and had his father-in-law brought before him. That Constantine, after hearing of his crimes, reprimanded him, and divested him of his imperial robes, but let him live back in the palace with him. But his father-in-law nevertheless continued to plot against Constantine and tried to involve his young daughter, Constantine's wife, in a plot to murder Constantine. But she only pretended to work with her father while telling Constantine of his plot. So when her father requested her to lower the guard to Constantine's room, she did so but with Constantine's knowledge. Her father then got up in the dead of night and went up to Constantine's room and told the guards that he had had a dream that he wanted to share with Constantine, and they let him in and he went in armed and killed the person in bed. But Constantine had put a eunuch in the bed and so wasn't killed himself. Instead, he appeared with a group of men once the deed had been done and gave his father-in-law a choice of death. And Maximian chose hanging. Eusebius, the writer Constantine tended to use for more religious matters, just skipped the whole affair in his Life of Constantine. The collection of speeches that I mentioned, the Panegyrici Latini, does mention it. It has Constantine's father-in-law fleeing to Marseille and reports that before he was handed over to Constantine, Constantine had sent his army up against its walls with ladders which were too short, resulting in him calling a retreat. In the alternative account, the latter's embellishment is an attempt by the emperor Theodosius to make Constantine's victories seem more like a case of Constantine having God on his side than it being Constantine's skill as a general. But if Constantine had tricked his father-in-law as you are suggesting in your alternative account, why would Theodosius not have mentioned it in the speeches that you are imagining he had made up? As in this alternative account, Theodosius is evolving the religious ideas constructed by Constantine. In this alternative account, it is under him that the Holy Trinity concept was invented to avoid the accusation that there were two gods, Jesus and his father. Having Constantine look a bit silly as a general by not getting the length of the ladders right is one thing. It makes Theodosius compare more favorably to Constantine. At least Theodosius had never miscalculated and sent brave troops up against walls with ladders too short. You get the idea. But on the other hand, Theodosius doesn't want Constantine thought of as a conniving villain because Theodosius is relying heavily on Constantine's Christianity. He knows the rumors about Constantine tricking his father-in-law by pretending to be planning on conquering across the Rhine in order to entrap him, and seeks in the speech to quell them. For example, the speech mentions the bridge being built, but reports it wasn't finished at the time the speech was being given, implying that it wasn't built by the time Constantine had his father-in-law killed, as that was reported in the speech. 
The speech goes so far as to try to explain away why the bridge would have been built if Constantine never expressed an intention of conquering across the Rhine. The suggestion is that it was built as an ornament. Obviously, in the alternative account, the building of such a monumental bridge was to convince his father-in-law that he really did intend to conquer and cross the Rhine. As I understand it, early analysis of the bridge posts dates them at about 310 CE using tree rings. There are apparently some concerns over the dating, but I haven't read those concerns. But if, for example, some were reliably dated to 311 CE or later, then, assuming Maximian did try to usurp Constantine in 310 CE, the bridge would not have been completed at the time Maximian tried to usurp Constantine. And my speculation of Constantine using the bridge would be wrong. I see, so please continue. In the alternative account, then, I am imagining that instead of Maximian and Maxentius managing to usurp Constantine, Constantine had managed to outmaneuver them, killing the more experienced of the duo and besmirching his reputation, and by association his sons. That Maxentius had in the short term been mainly concerned with further attempts by the Eastern Empire to attack, thinking that his father was dealing with Constantine. But now his father had played his hand and lost. He fully expected Constantine to start to plan against him. However, he hoped that his spies or his sister would give him fair warning. What Maxentius hadn't realized was that Constantine's planning against him wasn't triggered by his father's failed attempt at a coup. It had been underway before Constantine had even agreed to marry his sister, and Constantine's agents were already operating in areas under his control, spreading stories of how Constantine's mother was a follower of Jesus, and how Constantine was rumored to be one too. Speech 6 of the Panegyrici Latini claims that Constantine raided a tribe across the Rhine who weren't expecting Constantine's attack, and that many of the adults were captured. But being deemed too untrustworthy for military service and too ferocious for slaves, Constantine had them sent to an amphitheater for punishment, and that their great numbers wore out the animals. In the alternative account I'm imagining, the mention that the captives were not suitable for military service is a construction by Theodosius to remove the idea that Constantine might have somehow got extra men for his attack. The reason for it was that Theodosius wanted Constantine's victories to seem more miraculous. Instead, in the alternative account, Constantine fed as many of the captured to the animals as the animals could eat, and then while waiting for the animals to get hungry again, offered the rest the option of fighting for him, with the promise that if they did fight for him, he would not attempt to spread any further into their lands. A carrot and stick tactic. The carrot being that he wouldn't invade their people's land. The stick being that if they didn't agree, he would feed them to the animals. This idea of incorporating conquered people into the army as mentioned had been used by Alexander of Macedon, and in this alternative account Constantine had been using it too, making his army bigger than Maximian or Maxentius had ever realized. The historian Zosimus supports this idea to the extent that in the second book of Historia Nova or New History, he reported that the army Constantine used to attack his brother-in-law in Rome contained barbarians raised from the people he had conquered. Wouldn't the followers of Jesus in Constantine's army have been disturbed by Constantine inviting pagan troops into his army? No, I don't think so. I would expect there to have been more pagans in Constantine's army than in the region of the Eastern Empire where the news about Jesus had come from. Or than in the Roman-based armies. Since the news about Jesus had quickly traveled to Rome, plus the followers in Constantine's army would just see pagans as lost sheep that they were to help. So how does Constantine take Rome in your alternative account? Once he's confident that there will be no attacks from tribes across the Rhine, he takes pretty much his whole army south and starts a series of battles on his way to Rome. The plan worked. The followers of Jesus and his brother-in-law's armies were reluctant to fight against a leader who they thought was secretly a follower of Jesus. This reluctance gave Constantine victory after victory on his march to Rome. Victories in which the opposition tended to break and run. They broke and ran because the followers broke and ran, and when the others saw the followers breaking and running, they followed suit. His brother-in-law in Rome was aware of the rumors of Constantine converting, and suspected that Constantine had infiltrators in Rome who would try to start an uprising in Rome if it went to siege, perhaps even starting fires. That and his slight superiority in numbers encouraged him to meet Constantine's army on the battlefield. To prevent his men running, though, he marched them across the Tiber and lined them up with the river to their backs, 
to cut off the option of retreat and so encourage his men not to rout. But he had a high percentage of followers of Jesus in his army's ranks, bolstered by those followers which had deserted from the armies of Severus and Galerius when they had attacked. And even with their backs to the Tiber, they were reluctant to fight against Constantine's army, and the lack of resistance led to many of Maxentius's army being pushed into the Tiber and drowning. Apparently, Maxentius also fell into the river and drowned while trying to retreat. The twelfth speech from the Panegyrici Latini reports how Constantine had his wife's brother's body retrieved, hacked up, and the head paraded through Rome. Anyway, that brings us to the point of Constantine taking Rome aided by the support he got from the followers of Jesus. But you've claimed he adjusted that belief. Why risk adjusting it? Why not keep it as it is and enjoy their support? Because their understanding didn't suit him. Why not? Because in this alternative account, the followers thought of Jesus as being as human as Moses. But if Constantine was going to be thought of as a follower of Jesus, he didn't want Jesus to be human. It would suggest a human higher than the Roman emperor. His solution was to promote the idea that Jesus was not a human, but was instead a god. I see. Furthermore, to aid with the perception that Jesus was a god and not just a prophet, Constantine's narrative was going to have Jesus performing more miraculous acts than any human prophet. You haven't explained how Constantine thought he could get away with changing an account that the followers already knew. In this alternative account, at the time Constantine took Rome, the followers had text keepers. And while those text keepers may have been respected in various communities of the followers, they didn't have any authority. The followers' understanding being quite simple. That God was a loving, selfless God. The path was the loving, selfless path. All men and women were equal under God and each follower should try to help those off the path to realize the path and walk it. Explaining that they could repent and how they should show compassion to others. They also understood that Jesus had been wrongly convicted by men that misunderstood him, but that he showed no fear. And even after they had him sentenced to a painful death and nailed him to a cross, he performed the sign of Jonah that he had prophesied. Demonstrating that he was a prophet, and that their understanding was indeed from God. Their faith had spread quickly through the simple model of each follower actively trying to convert others. If each follower converted one person a year, the growth would be exponential. Copies of texts being made for followers who were going to spread the message and set up communities in new areas. But that meant that the text transmission took a tree-like structure which allowed Constantine the opportunity to try to convince each follower community that their view was a minority view, and that the wider view, that they had been unaware of, was that Jesus was a god, and had performed numerous miracles, and that this was something the Roman emperor, who had more of an overview than they did, believed. One of the first things Constantine did to aid with convincing the people was to follow up on the rumor that he had converted with a rumor that he had been communicated to by God, in such a way as to suggest he was a prophet. Numbers 12 verse 6 can be translated as, Now hear my words, if there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him in a vision. I will speak with him in a dream. And Constantine constructed the rumor that God had given him a vision in a dream before the battle Milvian Bridge. In chapter 44 of The Manner in Which the Persecutors Died, Lactantius reports Constantine being given a heavenly sign in a dream, and being commanded to put it on the soldier's shields. And though some suggest the sign in Lactantius's account was a Cairo, I should mention that there are others that contest that. Eusebius didn't mention anything about Constantine having a vision when he mentioned the Battle of Milvian Bridge in his books on the church history which he did when Constantine was alive. But he did mention both a vision and a dream in Book 1 of his work Life of Constantine, which he did after Constantine had died. He reported that Constantine had told him that he had prayed to God, and then he and his army were given a sign in the sky of a cross. And then later Christ visited him in a dream, showing the same sign as he saw in the heavens, and commanded him to make a likeness of the sign, and use it as a safeguard in encounters with his enemies. When describing the standard of the cross that was made, Eusebius mentions that the figure of the cross was made by means of a standard with a transverse bar laid over it. He mentions that there was a wreath fixed on the top, and that within the wreath was a symbol of the Savior's name. And he describes a Cairo, 
stating that it consisted of two letters indicating the name of Christ by means of its initial characters, the letter Chi being intersected by Rho through its center. He also mentioned that the emperor was in the habit of wearing these on his helmet at a later time. And there are coins and medallions which do depict the Chi Rho and could be thought to depict the banner. For example, there is a silver medallion which seems to show a standard, which is like a cross with something circular on the top part, and the emperor has a Chi Rho on his helmet. There are also later coins which clearly depict a Chi Rho and seem to link it to a standard. And in the alternative account, there is a reason Constantine selected the Chi Rho. It allowed Constantine to be ambiguous, giving a different impression to different audiences. To the followers, it strengthened the idea that Jesus was Christ, the sign being presented as a code for Christ. As it involves the first two letters of the word Christ in Greek, Chi and Rho, superimposed as capitals. To the Roman Epicureans, though, it allowed a different message to be presented. And that was the meaning the Chi Rho sign already had. A sign that was from the capital Chi being superimposed on the capital Rho. But not because they are the first two letters in the word in Greek for Christ, but because they were the first two letters in the ancient Greek word for useful. As I understand it, the Chi Rho was used in the margins of books to mark out text of interest, and even appears on a coin of Ptolemy III, who reigned over 500 years before Constantine, and over 100 years before Jesus would have been born. The message to the Epicureans was that Constantine was simply using the religion because it was useful to do so. Constantine then went on to make supervisors for the followers to enable him to control the religion. Some of the supervisors were pagan or Epicurean philosophers that were to masquerade as followers of Jesus. Others were text keepers who, under threat of death or torture during the persecutions, had chosen to hand over the texts they had been entrusted with and worship the state gods. While with the early followers there was equality between men and women which was reflected in their early artwork, Constantine's construction followed the Roman model of public office, in which it was the men that held the positions. And so all of Constantine's supervisors were male, quick to sense the danger that the church that he was building could become a dynastic construction that could threaten the dynasty he was preparing for himself and his future lineage. He ruled that those in office in the church, including the supervisors who were married, should be celibate and have no more children and those that did go on to have more children could no longer be supervisors. This was deemed to be declared at the Council of Elvira in Rule or Canon Number 33. Just as a side issue, although many date the Council of Elvira to being around 305 or 309, in this alternative account it is after the Battle of Milvian Bridge in 312. Though putting the supervisors in place didn't go totally smoothly. In some regions, the followers recognized the chosen supervisor was one that had handed over texts, which resulted in uproars from the followers, the most notable of which was in North Africa. These uproars had the potential to undermine Constantine's plan that his supervisors should have traction with the followers, which led Constantine to try to deal with them, becoming involved personally. For example, the representatives of the discontents in North Africa were requested to travel to Rome to have their case heard. And unsurprisingly, the supervisor of Rome who was handling the case judged in favor of the supervisor in Carthage. However, this wasn't entirely successful. The discontents just accused the supervisor in Rome of making a judgment that suited him without any proper investigation. Around 314 CE, Constantine tried again to resolve this issue. This time, he had the representatives travel to Arles to have the case heard by a council of supervisors. Constantine used this opportunity to have the council not just come up with a decision regarding the Carthaginian supervisor, but also to have them provide a list of rules for Constantine's church. One rule being those that laid down their weapons in times of peace should be excluded from the fellowship of the church. In this alternative account, the motive behind it was that Constantine didn't want the followers leaving the army to live a life of peace, because he was still looking to conquer the Eastern Empire, and the recalling of troops would give warning. Another rule was that if those serving in the government had to move in their job to a region which was under a different supervisor, then they had to present that new supervisor with a letter from their previous church supervisor regarding them. And that if they began to act against the church's discipline, they should be excluded from the fellowship. 
In this alternative account, the motive here is that it allowed the supervisor to be informed whether the person was a real believer or not. Furthermore, if they were a real believer, it allowed the supervisor to be informed whether they were an early follower or a recent convert. If they were an early follower, then the new supervisor would try to keep them away, as much as possible, from the other early followers in the new region. Because if they found out that the early followers in that region had previously shared the same understanding as themselves, then they might start to question whether their previous understanding had indeed been a minority view, and it might cause problems. Regarding the council's ruling for those accused of handing over texts during the persecutions, it agreed with the accusers that such people shouldn't be supervisors. It also proclaimed that no amount of witnesses were sufficient to prove such an accusation against an individual. And it didn't matter if such an individual had previously paid witnesses to suggest their innocence. What was needed was Roman records showing that the supervisor had handed over texts or sacred vessels or handed over the names of other followers. Without those, the accusers should themselves no longer be in the fellowship of Constantine's church. With any such records being destroyed, the supervisor of Carthage kept his position, and the accusers were expelled from the fellowship of Constantine's church. While some weren't happy with the decision, the vast majority were willing to accept the supervisors chosen by Constantine, as long as there weren't any Roman records to indicate that they had handed over texts. Anyway, although there were a few teething issues, in the alternative account, once Constantine had put the male supervisors in place, he started developing his new doctrine. In this alternative account, I'm imagining Constantine had learnt from history and had a background story for the church constructed by Eusebius, and also had some of the works of the early church fathers referenced by Eusebius constructed. The purpose of this background construction was to give the groups of early followers the impression that they were of a branch separate from the wider movement that had been going on, and to support the changes authorized by Constantine. For example, the work, The First Epistle of Clement to the Corinthians, starts off clearly trying to indicate that schisms within the community were nothing new, suggesting that there had been similar problems around a hundred or more years prior to Constantine. It contains the text, So the worthless rose up against the honored, those of no reputation against such as were renowned, the foolish against the wise, the young against those advanced in years. In the alternative account, the purpose is to make the followers who questioned Constantine's construction feel small and foolish. Were they renowned? No. Why then repeat the errors of the foolish that had gone before? Why try to sow distrust and cause trouble, rather than embracing the wisdom of the church fathers? So who are you suggesting Constantine was getting to write all this? Eusebius? Just to be clear, I'm not suggesting the alternative account is correct. I'm just giving an example of an alternative account. And in that alternative account, it would be mainly Epicurean philosophers, which is why many of the writings reflect a familiarity with Greek philosophy. I'm no expert, but don't many of the writings also display in-depth biblical knowledge? They do quote from many bits of the Bible, yes. So are you suggesting that these Epicurean philosophers all became biblical experts and then proceeded to forge texts on behalf of Constantine? I'm imagining it to be more organized that perhaps there would be a team of writers, and at the start each person would read perhaps one book of the Bible, and make notes of anything in the book that they thought might be useful. Then as each went on to produce the forged text, they would work off these shared notes, and reference each other's forgeries. The purpose of including many quotes being to give the impression that the work was written by a believer who had a far greater grasp of what was written than the vast majority of believers. The purpose of referencing each other's work was to make it seem as though there was overwhelming evidence that they were not forgeries. But given they were essentially forging works, the truth wasn't a priority for them. It was more whether what they produced would be sufficient to smooth over the worries of the vast majority of followers. Thus, not particularly caring that what they wrote would appear questionable if people were to check it up and read the context of what was being claimed, for example. Or whether their arguments really stood up to scrutiny. They assumed they were writing for the uneducated. Because few people would actually read the works, the majority would just be told about them. And if any believers did read the works, doubt them and cause trouble, then they would just be cast out of the church, and the followers be instructed to no longer have anything to do with them. In the alternative account, 
Constantine also had Greek translations of the Old Testament created to allow any tweaks that he wanted. Basically, in the alternative account, the forgeries were created on a scale that one could only seriously imagine being performed by an audacious Roman emperor whose rule over his empire relied upon it. About a decade later, with the majority of the forgeries complete, a creed was developed at the Council of Nicaea, which all followers in Constantine's church community had to agree to. It stipulated that Jesus was a god, and that although he was begotten, there was not a time when he didn't exist before he was begotten. It also stated that he suffered and rose again on the third day, and ascended into heaven, and would be coming back to judge the living and the dead. But even though the New Testament text by this time would have made it clear that according to them Jesus had resurrected, the creed didn't enforce this upon the followers. The way it was written still allowed those who believed he had escaped death to accept the creed. As it didn't mention death, and how him rising again on the third day was interpreted could depend on the belief of the reader. Nevertheless, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 13 to 15, for example, has Paul suggesting if Jesus had not been raised from the dead, then the followers' faith would be in vain. Obviously, the followers could disagree. As long as a loving, selfless God exists, their faith wouldn't be in vain. Plus, they would consider themselves to have had more than one prophesied sign to assure them that their faith wasn't in vain. And just to be clear, in this alternative account, Paul was a character constructed under Constantine to further the narrative that he wanted. Another thing noticeable about the creed is that while the Holy Spirit was mentioned, there was no indication at this point that it was a person. The idea of it being a holy attitude shared by the Father and the Son is compatible with the creed. The creed was later changed, though, under the Emperor Theodosius, the man who in this alternative account had the Panagirici Latini constructed. The speeches which included Constantine sending his men against the walls of Marseille with ladders that were too short. The creed under Theodosius did have superficial similarities to the one under Constantine, but is noticeably different. No longer can the Holy Spirit be interpreted as the holy attitude. Instead, it is clearly a person, a Lord, the giver of life. And in this alternative account, it is under Theodosius that the doctrine of the Holy Trinity came about. Theodosius's creed also requires a belief in the Virgin Mary, though neither the creed under Constantine nor the creed under Theodosius required the person to believe that Jesus died and resurrected. Only that he suffered, was buried, and then rose. The reason for mentioning the later creed is that in this alternative account, the understanding wasn't simply changed by one person. If you were to look at the profession of faith of the Roman Catholic Church, for example, while its similarity to the creeds under Constantine and Theodosius can be seen, there are more things added. It does require a person to believe that Jesus died and resurrected. It also requires a person to believe both what is written and what is handed down by tradition. It also requires the person to profess that the person will submit their will and intellect to what the Pope or college bishops use their authority within the church to teach on religious matters, for example. Okay. Well, I think this is probably a good place to leave it for now. As while you have explained why in your alternative account Constantine wanted to take over the understanding and modify it, what you haven't yet got around to is explaining how your alternative account resolves the examples of biblical texts that you have problems with. Are you okay to come back and talk to us again? I'd be happy to. Thank you. Thank you. Well, listeners, that's it for now. I hope you enjoyed it, and will join us for the next one. Bye for now.